And then last, um, workbook checklist. I just posted in the group the, the workbook. This, I'm gonna do a lot of my teaching tonight off of the discovery checklist, which is in the workbook, but um, that, that whole workbook you can download and have handy, okay? Let's see if we're ready to rock and roll here. So I have had the opportunity to meet a lot of you guys whether it's through the my support group, uh, whether I've done assessments with you or I, I've helped you or answered your emails, that kind of stuff. Um, but a lot of you don't know me. So let's talk about who I am and why I should be here teaching you tonight. So I, by background and profession, am a dental hygienist. So uh, retired. Uh, hi, Martha. <laughs> I retired a couple years ago and decided to go all in on my myofunctional therapy business. And the reason that I did that, I get asked this a lot because people think dental hygiene is just a great career, which it is for a lot of people. Uh, for me, I found out that once I knew about myofunctional impairment and tongue ties and breathing issues and sleep apnea concerns and all of that stuff, I really struggled working for dentists who were only worried about cavities, um, flying first class, and crowns or whatever. You know, nobody was looking for the root cause. They were going to give you an appliance for snoring. They were going to give you an appliance for grinding, but they weren't going to help you solve the problems. And so once I knew about myofunctional therapy, once I knew all of the things and all of the ways that I could help, I couldn't keep doing it. So that's why I left. So now I have clients, I think, in every time zone around the world. I'm also a speaker and a writer, and I'm a wellness coach uh, or wellness warrior and a coach. And a lot of people really compartmentalize a tongue tie and myofunctional impairment with wellness. And wellness, you guys, is just really this big umbrella because let's face it, if you don't sleep right, if you don't eat right, if you don't move your body, all of those things which are affected by sleep, breathing, um, you're, you're going to feel like a pile of poop, okay? So I always tell people I work in wellness. Uh, I also am an airway provider for the Foundation for Airway Health, which is why we're doing this, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. I'm a trainer also, so I am the creator and the founder of the Myo Mastery program, and then I also had a new program this year that's Triumph Business Training for Myofunctional Professionals. So that pro, those two programs um, teach dentists, dental hygienists, and speech therapists. Um, those are the ones who I let take the program. If you have questions about that, you're going to have to email me because I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Uh, and then last, my best title yet is Educator Extraordinaire. And I really covet this title because I spend hundreds of hours every year giving, 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 educating, teaching people so that they can know this stuff. They might not become clients of mine at that time, but if they take what I teach them and they go home to their dad who might have sleep apnea or that kind of stuff, um, their spouse, then, then that is worth it to me. So why am I doing this? Uh, so first of all, Global Airway Health Day is October 2nd. It's going to be great. There's going to be a ton of stuff. I wanted to do something different, so that's why we're starting this early because I'm going to teach this all the way up until that point. The other reasons are because there's confusion. A lot of people know that they have concerns. They know they have a tongue tie. They just don't know where to start. They don't know who to trust, um, making heads or tails. They ask their doctor, they ask their dentist, um, they're poo-pooed, nobody knows. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is financial and time barriers. No matter how you look at it, the dollar, especially because I have a global practice, the dollar is different everywhere. And some people might have all the time in the world, no money, and the other way around. So that's one of the other reasons. And then I wanted to I wanted to do this group the group support kind of framework because I think that there's more accountability when you work in a group. So that's why we're doing it. Okay, so what are we going to do over the next four days? I'm going to take you guys on the exact journey that I take a new client. Sometimes I have maybe talked with somebody before this point. But I am going to teach you, take you through the steps that I do with everybody. So if you're new to me, 
you don't know that I teach really from a roadmap or a framework or a structure. I, I don't just fly by the seat of my pants and I find that a lot of people like that. Uh, the other thing is, is if you're not here live, that's okay. You can watch them after the fact. They're going to be here for a few days, then we'll take them down. So this group will archive and you won't be able to access this stuff. But I, since I have people around the world right now who are sleeping, they're going to watch it tomorrow. So uh, clarity is the first step. So in lesson one, which is tonight, and then lesson two, we're going to be gaining clarity. Lesson three is commit, and then lesson four is complete. So that is the plan. So in clarity, tonight we're going to do the first half of the discovery assessment. So I estimated that we'll go, um, if you look at your discovery checklist, that we'll go through digestive stuff. Okay, so that's as far as I want to get tonight. Um, and then tomorrow night, lesson two, we're going to do the second half and we're going to do the functional assessment. I encourage you to bring a hand mirror because uh, unless you are on date night and you've got hubby there to help you, watching as I have you demonstrate something, being able to watch yourself rather, you know, in a mirror rather than this little camera, I think will be helpful. So just an idea. So that's going to be lesson one and two. Lesson three is going to be um, understanding what what you've discovered, what you've uh, we're going to unpack it and then committing to ditch the tie if that's what you want to do. So not everybody's going to want to or at least not this quarter, but you're going to have that opportunity. And then lesson four, which is going to be on Friday. So that's for Global Airway Health Day. I'm going to teach a full session all the way from start to finish. So exactly what I teach, talk about all of that stuff with somebody who's just starting out. So let's talk about if you're in the right place. Um, I hope that if it says, if, if the group is called Ditch the Tongue Tie, I hope that that means that you either suspect a tie, you know you have a tie, or perhaps you had a, re a release without myofunctional therapy. Uh, I know I did a poll in the group. I know a lot of people know that they have a tie. Uh, and then a lot of people suspect that they do. So many people who reach out to me, I feel like by the time you know who I am and what I do, you you know that you have a concern, okay? Um, if you've had a release without myofunctional therapy, that's a little bit of water under the bridge. You might have had some relief at this point, but you're not on top of your game. You're not 100%. So, so this is for you also, if you're one of those people. Uh, next, some people don't want to only walk through and do their own exam because that's really what we're doing. This is what I'm going to take you through between today and tomorrow is exactly what I do with people. Uh, if you want me to do your exam, you can go right to my website. There's the link and there's the, the code. You can do type that in, get a discount. The only difference between what we're going to go through here and what that will be is that you'll have a written report. So not, not necessary, but some people want it. And I've had a lot of emails for that. All right, so let's talk about the quarter four challenge right here at the beginning, um, just because I've had so many emails. So today and tomorrow, you're going to be going through all of the stuff for a test or, or an exam to determine if you have a tongue tie or a pretty high likelihood whether you have a tongue tie or not. This opportunity is for somebody who wants to continue on or who already has scheduled their phrenectomy in the fourth quarter. I am committed to doing this for five quarters, you guys. So probably not at 297, but I'm doing it all of next year. So that's why we're starting this year because we anticipate to start small. Um, so I'm going to be teaching 10 live sessions in a private Facebook group, 24-7 access. So obviously, if you're somewhere else in the world, you can do that. It closes October 16th. No exceptions. And the reason that is, is because I'm not doing this to, to earn something. I'm doing it to help you. And I don't want you to be able to start or be starting and be way behind. So there'll be other quarters to, to do it next year. Um, you have to email me to enroll, so I'll give you that email at the end. One thing that I do want to say here, I know there's a lot of people in this group that are therapists and you're here to learn from me and I, I 
am really honored for that. I just want you to know that this is for therapy for people who are having a phrenectomy. I just don't want there to be any confusion. It's not meant to train you. It's meant to help them. So if you have questions, certainly ask me. All right, so the biggest questions that I answer in the hundreds of emails that I answer every week are, number one, does this look like a tongue tie? People send me their pictures. And I want you guys to know right out of the gate here that it's not about appearance. If you're in any of the other Facebook groups, you probably have heard me and all of the other wonderful therapists out there saying, it's not about appearance. Now I get some of you have a tongue tie that is what I call low hanging fruit, meaning it's obvious, it's severe. I mean, we, we can see it just in watching people talk. So I know that that um, with appearance, that's obvious, okay? But for everybody else, you guys, it's not about appearance, it's about the functional impairment that's present. So I always say it's, it's about the, the myofunctional impairment snapshot. So I look at how else everything looks for you before I even look at the tongue tie, okay? The next question that I answer a lot is, do I need to release my tie? And yes, in most cases you do, and you're gonna learn why here. If I do my job, you're gonna know why you're not gonna answer, uh, wonder about that anymore. And then the third question is, how much is myofunctional therapy? If I can just get something through to you, it's not just about price, it's about relationship. It's about the know, like, and trust factor. It's about having a connection with somebody. So never, whether you're doing a phrenectomy now or whether you're planning it next year or whenever you can find the time, don't let price be the sole reason because I have a feeling that you'll be disappointed. All right, so now I'm going to talk about um, some things that I feel are pretty obvious, but if somebody is new to the tongue tie world or new to me, new to myofunctional therapy, I wanted to answer some basic questions. So what is a tongue tie? So many people somehow end up in Facebook groups and they start learning about this, but they don't really know what it is. So if you lifted up your tongue and you looked, we all have that collagen fiber under there. It's called the lingual frenulum. Frenum depends on where you are or what your education is on what you call it. So I'll just call it the frenum. In somebody who has a tongue tie, that could be it could insert in the wrong place. So meaning if it inserts on the tongue, in the middle of the tongue, some people call that normal, okay? So they're looking at the free tongue here. So some doctors or dentists would call that normal. But if that insertion is out here, you clearly have a problem. So that's one thing that we look at. If it's short, too thick, too tight, it's inserted in the wrong place, it inserts into the floor of the mouth, it's congenitally there. So it doesn't just grow. You don't just wake up one Sunday morning and have it. It's there about halfway through your mother's pregnancy with you, okay? So that's what a tongue tie is. So why does it matter? Again, because I work with clients age three to 80 is my age range for, for clients right now, it's hard to have a catch-all answer for everybody, but I can tell you this. It matters because it alters the function. The longer that you do something wrong, the more it matters. So if you limp, if you have a bad knee and you limp for a long time, eventually it's gonna bother your back. Uh, what a three-year-old experiences is way different than what my 80-year-old experiences. So a tongue tie matters because it alters the oral function. It doesn't matter because you can't lick an ice cream cone, okay? It doesn't matter so much that you kiss like a parrot, okay? And I say that because I had a dentist say that to me about his wife, which I thought was awful. So it's more about the long-term consequences of it rather than just this little piece of, oh, just a symptom right now, okay? I hope that makes sense. So why is identification not black and white? Again, you guys, this is not a pregnancy test and I wish it was a lot easier. And we all know people who have had a pregnancy test and, um, and it was wrong, okay? The problem with this is depending on who you're asking, what their education level is, 
Are they 900 years old? I can guarantee you if you ask the dentist right now who is really cutting edge, coming out of school, very forward thinking, he's gonna have a different opinion than the dinosaur that your family might have been seeing for the last 40 years, okay? Um, it, I think it's gonna get better. Some countries, Brazil to name one, has a law, so every infant that is born gets screened for a tongue tie. But the problem is, is who's teaching that? Who's enforcing it? How are they making it be yes or no? It's not yes cancer, no cancer. Um, I diagnose ties all the time on people that were told that they were fine. That's the problem. That goes back to that impairment, not appearance, okay? So that's why it's really hard. You have to talk to somebody who knows and understands this stuff. If you asked 20 dentists and doctors, 19 of them are probably gonna get it wrong. It takes 17 years to, for a paradigm shift. So um, when I'm done working, this is probably gonna be normal stuff, but right now it's not. So that's why it's so tricky. And that's why it's so hard for you as a, as a client or somebody who's suffering, that's why it's so hard for you to know who to trust because you ask, you know, Person A, what they think, they tell you you're fine, you ask person B, you get a different answer, you ask me, you get something totally different. Uh, what is myofunctional therapy? Which OMT stands for oral facial myofunctional therapy. You're gonna hear it called multiple different things. I call it myo, myofunctional therapy. Uh, what is it and why is it so important? So again, I hope that since you're here, this is not a new term to you, but my elevator speech is that it's like physical therapy for mouth and face muscles. I help you rehabilitate the oral structures. Just because you have a release doesn't mean you're ready to go. If you've been in a wheelchair for 10 years and you realize that your feet still work, you don't just go dancing. That's the same thing of what I do. The reason it's so important is because you um, you don't go to the doctor and get a new hip without some sort of physical therapy. The same thing here. You will find somebody, you, you could probably find a dozen people right now who would go ahead and do your phrenectomy. They're not gonna say anything about myofunctional therapy. They're not gonna say anything about wound management. They might be able, they might be saying, yep, we can do it right now. It only takes five minutes. No, 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 no. Uh, and, and we'll talk more about this as we get in probably into lesson three. Uh, it's so important because you have to prepare, you have to heal, and then you have to rehabilitate. So a lot of people will ask me, Carmen, what's most important? And I feel like there's three distinct areas. I have to prepare you, then we have to heal properly, and then we have to rehabilitate after that, okay? Um, ideal time frame. Um, ideal time frame it, for me is to, I start my therapy with clients two months before they have a release, okay? So that's ideal. That doesn't mean that I don't have people contact me every day that just had it done. I don't know why, I, I do know why it happens. Uh, I wish it wasn't, but it is. And so again, that's the ideal time frame. Why does it matter? Um, it matters because for a few reasons. Uh, it matters because I have people come from all over the world to see providers in the United States. I have people travel, I don't know where you guys are, I'm in Colorado. I have people come from five states away to see my provider in Colorado. I mean, people travel, it matters. And I want you to have a good procedure. Nobody wants to do it more than once. Uh, when you have good myofunctional therapy and you've got muscle tone and control, you get a smaller wound. And you guys, let's face it, Fuzzy targets don't get hit. So if you can't even get your tongue up and hold your mouth open, your doctor's gonna be going in there with a laser or with a scalpel and, and they're just going in blind. So that's why it's so important. This graphic that you see here on this slide is from a provider that I worked with in Texas. And it, this is why that, it, that the time frame matters. I can't have somebody come from Paris to see Dr. Zoggy in LA and not be ready. So if you're planning ahead, I don't want you to get in a hurry. We'll talk more about this as we go, but that's why the time frame matters. Okay, discovery checklist time. I think we're ready to get into the nitty gritty. Um, okay, why I use this. So I started using this this year 
And the reason it is, is so that I can talk with you about your situation. I, you can see there's a lot of stuff on here. So I just discovered that I could have a more personable conversation with somebody if they knew, if I knew what their situations were. Why talk about speech problems with a tongue tie if they never had those concerns? So that's why I started using this. What I'm looking for as I use this is red flags. I, I very often like to look at this, formulate an opinion about whether you have a tongue tie or not before I even see inside your mouth. And I love it because it challenges me. So when somebody emails me this and it's, it's black because they've marked everything, you guys, I know you have a tongue tie. I know you've got concerns. And the other thing is, is it helps you see why you have concerns, okay? So it helps you own that you that there's something that needs to be done here. So I'm looking for red flags. How we're going to use it is I want you marking things if you already haven't, things that apply to you because on the the third lesson when we unpack what you're seeing, what this means to you, how can you benefit from having a phrenectomy, from doing myofunctional therapy, all of that stuff, um, you're going to have it here on this page. Your workbook is a little bit fancier and, and it has a lot more room to write, but as you have questions, comments, things like that, I encourage you to put them there. Okay, so when I do an exam with somebody, I am looking for several things. So first of all, you guys, I'm looking to identify an airway crisis. Um, sleep apnea is the most expensive chronic degenerative disease out there. You will learn as we go through this, you will see that my my passion is sleep, sleep apnea, breathing, that kind of stuff. Uh, and we will talk in depth about sleep when we finish up tomorrow with the exam part. Um, but when I do this, I'm looking first to identify airway crisis. If you can't get air, if you're not getting air, if your kid's not getting air, I don't care about your tongue tie until we figure out what else is going on, okay? So I'm looking at that first. The second thing I'm looking for is, do you have a tie or no tie? At the end of the day, myofunctional impairment is, is the same. I just have to determine, do you have a physical barrier or do you not? Everything else is the same. And then I'm looking to identify OMDs, which are orofacial myofunctional di disorders. Uh, anything that keeps you from functioning properly whatever the function of those of these facial muscles are, whatever the, the function of the tongue is, all of that stuff, if you're doing it wrong, then you have an OMD. So it's kind of a, a fancy term. All right, let's jump in, you guys. So what I'm going to do is we're going to just go section by section. Remember, we're only going to do half tonight because I want to let everybody out of here. Um, what I intend to do is just kind of explain like why I'm asking this, okay? Does this apply to you? If it doesn't apply to you, if it doesn't just off the top of your head make you say, yes, that was me. I had breastfeeding issues. Yes, that was me. Don't, I'm not looking for you to dig, dig, dig because we don't need this page to have a whole bunch of stuff that, that you've made worse. We're looking just for, um, for the low hanging fruit, if you will. Okay, so first in the infancy and early childhood area, I, the, and this might be an area where you have to ask your mom or family members potentially if you, if, if mom isn't around to ask. Um, this is important because I, I'm going all the way back to you as an infant because obviously if you had a tongue tie, you were born with it. So if you had trouble, um, if you had difficulty nursing, the other thing that I ask often is, how was this for mom? Did mom nurse you till you were three, but it was miserable for her? You know, those are things that we want to know. Just because you nursed doesn't mean that, you, that you're out of the woods for having a tongue tie. Um, I often ask people, are you the oldest? Because say, if you have marked down on your discovery checklist that you had difficulty nursing, but mom did it forever, um, you know, for several months, a year, 18 months, whatever, and she was miserable or she didn't report anything and you have all of these other things that look like a tongue tie, then I say, are you the oldest? Because let's face it, 
mom might not have known. She might have just thought that you were evil and you were awful and that nursing was supposed to hurt that bad. Uh, not always, but that's very common when I have people say, no, my mom nursed me. It wasn't great and it wasn't the best experience, but she did it because she thought that's what you do. The other thing I want you to think about is, did she nurse or did she bottle feed you because it was easier? Now, often I get people that say, um, my mom bottle fed me because that was just the thing to do. Or she bottle fed me because she had to go back to work. That's not what I'm digging for here. I'm digging for those red flags that say, I had trouble nursing. I had trouble as an infant. Uh, were you a happy baby, sad, miserable, cranky, cried a lot? Did you have colic? You guys, colic is just this big catch-all term for a child who's unhappy. And a child who's unhappy and has a tongue tie very often is um, gassy and spits up a lot. And I mean, I've had clients that say they had reflux so bad, they, they were medicated at six days old, and mom and dad had to prop him up in the corner of a crib. Okay, if that's you, you got a problem, okay? So make sure you're marking that off. Um, did you eat messy? Did you click? Did you, did, you know, milk run out of your face? Did you um, choke a lot? The other thing is, sometimes mamas will say, my baby was happy and, you know, breastfe breastfed without any issue. However, you know, Johnny would fall asleep at the breast. He was just a happy little guy, but he'd fall asleep at the breast. You guys, you fall as uh, a, an infant falls asleep at the breast because <laughs> eating is tiring. So, so Johnny has a snack, has a nap, has a snack, has a nap. So you're not a ha an unhappy kiddo, but we've got this kiddo who might be gaining weight, is just happy, but again, there's red flags. You know, oftentimes, especially if you're a mom watching this and you um, you you breastfed, um, your kids, sorry, dog alarm going off. Um, if you breastfed your kids, you know that there's some something called living on the letdown. So oftentimes we'll start to see kiddos that are gaining weight, they're happy, they're nursing all the time, so you're a 24 hour cafeteria, but that nobody identifies that tie because you're not failing to thrive, you're not losing weight, all of that stuff. So I hope that makes sense. Um, the other thing is ear infections. Now this is not 100% of the time, but it's very common. When I have somebody, I'm trying to dig and discover whether they have a tongue tie or not, and they had a lot of ear infections, or maybe they had tubes placed. And that just is indicative of a swallow that's not, in, that, that's not correct. And we know that anybody who has a tongue tie doesn't swallow correct. And we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. Um, the eustachian tubes um, drain across, you know, along here. If the swallow is inadequate or it's incorrect, oftentimes there's problems with ear infections. Not all the time, so don't bet the farm on it. But if, you're, if you have filled this out and you're saying, I didn't nurse. My mom said I was a miserable kid. I cried all the time. I was gassy. I projectile vomited all the time. And I had ear infections. There's a lot of red flags there, okay? Then last year on this slide is trouble transitioning to solids. So in children who have a tongue tie, the tongue is tied down. It's not allowed to manipulate and control food like it's supposed to. The tongue is meant to be a tool. It's supposed to help keep the food on, on the molars. It's supposed to help, um, help, help you in that process. If you have trouble manipulating food, a, a toddler is going to be the first to say, mm, no thanks, I would much rather have mashed baby food, I would rather have applesauce, pudding, chicken nuggets, yogurt, you know. And so while I know we're talking about infancy and early childhood, there's that also. And we talk more about this in, in the digestive section, but it gets exacerbated as, as a child with a tongue tie grows because they have trouble with certain things. So if your mom says, yeah, you wouldn't eat, you know, A, B, and C, why wouldn't you eat A, B, and C? Very often when I'm digging with clients to, you know, to make this identification of a tongue tie, 
they're struggling to, um, to understand how this is all connected. So I hope that makes sense. All right, let's move into airway and breathing concerns. Okay. So when I look at the discovery checklist, when I get this from somebody, my eyes go directly to breathing, sleep, digestive stuff, okay? So breathing is huge. So I'm gonna just kinda of go down this slide and then I'll look here to see if I want to talk about anything else. So do you have breathing concerns? If you're somebody who already has asthma, emphysema, COPD, you know, that kind of stuff, that's what I'm talking about, okay? Um, next is allergies. So allergies are something that's chronic at this point for a lot of people. Since the Industrial Revolution, really, I mean, our houses have gotten better sealed, so there's more, um, there's more allergens inside. We also spend a lot of time inside. Population has exploded, so there's pollution, that kind of stuff. But um, allergies are, are something that so many of my breathing clients suffer with. I did too, and you guys might already know this about me, uh, but I used to be the world's biggest mouth breather and take four allergy pills a day to fight that chronic congestion. So I'm gonna skip down to that and let's talk about that chronic congestion because this is something I hear all the time and so many of you just think it's your normal, okay? So you don't realize something's broken until I point it out to you. So I want to quickly explain the vicious cycle of mouth breathing. Your brain thinks that you only know how to nasal breathe. That's how you were designed. So when, so, so you have a balance of oxygen and CO2, and most of us think that CO2 is just a waste product. Um, but it's important that our body have a balance. So when you are mouth breathing, you're exhaling that CO2 and your brain, your reptile brain that's trying to keep you safe and healthy is saying, holy cow, you're letting out too much CO2 because you need to have that balance, okay? And so when you're mouth breathing, your brain doesn't know that, that it's coming out your mouth, not your nose. So it instructs the goblet cells in your nose to increase or to secrete more mucus. So that makes you more congested. So very vicious cycle. It can take 20 to 40 minutes for you to get out of that. So that's really, really common. The other thing, and I don't think I talk about it here on this slide, is a lot of us exacerbate the problem by pets, by diet. Um, let me touch on diet. Sugar, gluten, dairy, and alcohol are the four biggest inflammatory agents. So when you have an inflammatory diet, it causes more congestion. So while my goal when I start working with somebody is that we correct the mouth breathing so that they can be nasal breathing, if they're making the problem worse by having a diet that is, is I mean, it's just like one step forward, one back. So I will encourage people to cut those things out. You would be amazed at how many people will say, yeah, I get really gunky or snotty or I can't breathe or I have to use a nebulizer after I have dairy. But doesn't it just make more sense to not have it or to really limit it? The other thing is pets. I'm a pet person. I would never tell somebody not to get, you know, not to have their pets. But when I have somebody say, I have chronic congestion and when I let my cat sleep on my pillow, and I am allergic to cats, it causes more congestion. Like, hello, this doesn't take rocket science to say, well, could we get fluffy out of the bedroom? Could we have clean bedding? So that's important to think about. Um, dry chap lips, if you marked this off, that's likely because you're a mouth breather. So many people will say to me, nope, I'm a nasal breather. Nope, my mouth is closed, I'm nasal breathing all the time, and they send me pictures and they have these terrible chapped lips. That's very indicative of lips being slightly apart and, and more mouth breathing than you think. So I'm not saying that's the only way that you can have chapped lips, but it's very common. Okay, moving on. 
have you had surgery for a breathing condition? So did you have your tonsils or adenoids taken out or just the adenoids? Deviated septum, um, turbinate reduction. The thing that is so frustrating is that doctors will take tonsils and adenoids out and not one word will be said that you need to nasal breathe. Not one. Um, I have a lot of clients who have had nasal surgery and nobody ever told them that they needed to learn how to nasal breathe. So that's why I ask, if you have had this and you're checking this off, that's telling me, okay, we probably have a red flag here because they probably didn't get the right instruction, okay? Uh, have you been told that you should have? I get a lot of people, we do an exam, and they say, well, yeah, Carmen, I have these nasty tonsils that touch. They're gonna have to get something done about those because I can't teach nasal breathing when you have this obstacle in your throat. I can't help you get rid of snoring and decrease your sleep apnea risk if you have this massive obstacle back there, okay? Um, and then on here, I have you write down what percentage of the day you are nasal breathing. So actually on the discovery checklist, there's a spot for mouth breathing and nasal breathing. When I ask my clients, how much of the day are you nasal breathing? The reason that I say of the day is because that's obviously the only portion that you're aware of, okay? Mouth breathing at night is a whole nother animal, but we have to get there. So we tackle during the daytime first. Uh, and that is, when you're thinking about this, that is when you're not eating, when you're not talking, okay? So when your mouth should be closed, how much of the time is that, okay? And then last here on the bottom. So you will not be able to do this right now while I'm teaching, but I want you to do it before tomorrow or definitely before Wednesday because it's, it's making sure that you can nasal breathe. So one of the things that I have to have my potential clients do is demonstrate 10 nasal breaths, okay? The reason that is, is because if they have a physical obstruction, they can't start therapy. If you can't nasal breathe, you're not ready to start therapy. You're not ready to tackle this phrenectomy at this point, okay? You have to be able to nasal breathe. If you can nasal breathe for a minute, you can nasal breathe for life. We just have to get you there. But if you can't do it, if you try and demonstrate 10 nasal breaths and you collapse your, uh, your nostrils, we got, you, you have to have free flowing air. So when you do this, I want you to just sit down and relax. If you have a partner who can watch you do it, that's perfect because I want them to be able to see what your re reaction is. Because when I have somebody demonstrate it, the first thing I see is their eyeballs get as big as saucers. And that's because they might be telling me, yeah, I nasal breathe. It's not their normal. They're saying they can, but they really don't. And suddenly their life is flashing before their eyes because they think, oh, I don't know if I can do this. So if somebody's eyeballs get gigantic, that just tells me, okay, this isn't their normal. Um, then as you're, as you're doing it, trying to get to the 10 breaths, what does it feel like? Does it feel challenging? Can you finish it? Can you not? Are your nostrils collapsing? The other thing is pay attention to belly breathing versus shallow thoracic breathing. So when I watch my, my clients do it, many of them can do nasal breathing, but they're breathing here. When you're thoracic breathing, you're only using the upper portion of your lungs. Belly breathing, you guys, is so much better. Uh, I don't know the percentage of people here who are men and women, but as a woman, I can say it, it's really hard and unnatural for us females to belly breathe because we have spent our whole life sticking our chest out and sucking in our gut, which is totally opposite. The diaphragm is meant to go like this. So on compression, on the exhale, it massages the digestive organs. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But that that's so important for breathing so we're supposed to be belly breathing not breathing up here so i want you to pay attention to that and then really the next question says are you constantly stimulating your fight or flight so when you're thor thoracic shallow breathing you're um that's your emergency breathing that's 
running from that saber-toothed tiger, from that woolly mammoth. So just trying to get you to identify how you're breathing. What's that like? Uh, let me see if there's anything else here. I think I've really covered it all. So put yourself through through 10 nasal breaths. Make sure you, you see what that's like. Again, if you can do it, and it's not your norm, that's okay. I just want you to know that you can so that you can comfortably and confidently make that decision. Yes, I'm good to move forward with my tongue, with my phrenectomy, okay? Um, next, let's see where we're headed here. Oral rest posture. Do you know where your tongue should go? At this point, a lot of you probably do because you, you've you've fallen into this rabbit hole um, but I'm always surprised at how many people book an exam with me and they they have no idea so think about this like right now if you freeze where is your tongue is it down is it up is it just the tip or is the back of it the dorsum up that's what I'm asking with oral rest posture if you stick your tongue out and you've got like um, scallop so if it looks like a lace doily around the edge that tells you that your tongue is laying down because it's laying inside of your teeth um, does your tongue push on your teeth what i'm asking you to do is kind of get in 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 tune with where it's at which is hard when i just catch you off the spot so you you can think about this after the fact also do you think it's worse to have a tongue thrust or incorrect oral rest posture and I'll let you think about that for a second um, I get probably 50 phone calls a week from people saying hey my orthodontist sent uh, has had me call you because of tongue thrust and I want to make sure that you work with tongue thrust what's more important is where your tongue is in correct posture so tongue thrust can be detrimental absolutely um, there's mixed opinions on that for sure but I can say that since I was getting braces for the third time I know that tongue thrust definitely has an impact but most important is tongue posture so if your tongue is laying low it's not in the roof of the mouth where it needs to be so that takes me on to the next point of that of your tongue posture affecting craniofacial development this is for adults, so I don't think that there's a lot of um, discussion to be had about kiddos, but if the tongue is low, it's not supporting the scaffolding of the mouth. So the maxilla, which is your upper jaw, is supposed to develop the biggest, and it's supposed to be like a, a lid on the box. When the tongue is up, it helps spread that out. It helps the ceiling of the palate come down so that, that you're not high and narrow, and uh, when it brings the ceiling down, guess what? It takes the roof of the mouth out of the sinus cavity and it, it spreads so that the mandible will grow properly as well. So we're adults, we are already developed, but you can look at this face and you can see that I was a mouth breather because my face grew down and long and narrow um, because my tongue wasn't up. I didn't have a tongue tie, but my tongue was low postured, okay? So when we're talking about correct oral rest posture, I want you to ask yourself, is your mouth closed, lip sealed, and teeth, uh, mouth closed, lip sealed, and tongue up? Teeth gently apart, I don't have that on here. A lot of people will say, how should my mouth be? And I say about a millimeter apart, so just relaxed, okay? Um, next, let's talk about un the inability to close the lip. So we call that an incompetent lip. My best explanation here is if you walked on your tiptoes for a long time, your calf muscle is not going to allow you to then walk flat footed, at least not comfortably. The same thing with the lips. So as the lips start to part and they roll up and they become incompetent, a lot of people have trouble holding them close. They're weak, okay? So not only do we need to stretch those muscles out and get them so that they're working, but we need to get them strong so that they can be closed without you struggling. Okay, let me make sure that with oral rest posture, 
that I didn't miss anything. Really what you're wanting to just make sure that you have recorded is where your tongue is, how much of the time your mouth is open. Um, open mouth resting posture, you, you guys, is it even if your lips are slightly parted. Okay, so if you have questions, ask me about that. Let's move on to digestive and eating behaviors. This is gonna be the last part of what we go through tonight. I think this is probably the biggest area that I have people that are just wowed. And I never wanna sound like a snake oil salesman. I never want somebody to feel like I'm trying to sell you, you a used Subaru. It is so connected, if you will. It's so tied to tongue tie. Uh, I always tell people, if you have digestive issues that are related to myofunctional impairment, they're going to they're going to disappear. Some are faster than others, but you're going to see um, great results when you do myofunctional therapy, when you have a release. So first, are you somebody who has frequent digestive distress? You might have to think about this for a little bit. The reason is, is because you might be living your norm. So you might be suffering from bloating, hiccuping, belching, gas, constipation, um, acid reflux, stomach aches all the time. That might just be your normal. So you might have to think about it um, to see if that's something that you suffer from. The other thing is, is are you a mouth breather? So parasympathetic, Versus, which is that fight or flight, or, or no, sympathetic, which is fight or flight, parasympathetic is the rest and digest. If you're a mouth breather, you're always running from that saber-toothed tiger. You guys, your body doesn't care about what's going on with your burrito if you're in fight or flight, okay? If you're running from a bad guy, who cares about that? So you gotta think about that. Acid reflux is something that so many people medicate for and they forget. Like they've been taking that medicine for, uh, you know, a bazillion years and they just forget. So if that's you, why are you taking it? Uh, acid reflux is, uh, is a big concern for sleep apnea too. So, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Next, I want you to think about eating. Is eating enjoyable to you? Is it a lot of work? Okay. It, if eating is a chore when you have a tongue tie it's like you're working against an, you know one of those elastic bands so for some people they absolutely hate eating they hate it they don't want to do it socially they do it just obviously to live um do you have slow eating behaviors do you have rapid eating behaviors and it seems kind of weird that i would ask you a question that it's like six of one half dozen of the other but what I find is I get a lot of people who have slow eating behaviors, and that's because eating is work. It takes a lot of time to chew that pork chop. It takes a lot of time to chew that steak, okay? Then we've got rapid eating behaviors, which leads really to a lot of choking, but also hiccuping, belching, bloating gas, you know, swallowing air. I probably have more people who are rapid eaters and that's because eating sucks, it's a lot of work, they don't enjoy it, they don't chew their food properly, which is slowly bilaterally, and they don't chew it adequately. A lot of my clients will say, I chew my food just enough to swallow and get it down the hatch so that, nothing, so that I don't choke. Rapid eating behaviors, we obviously have to get them slowed down, but it's so easy because you can only eat as fast as the correct swallowing mechanics will allow. So I hope that makes sense. Um, choking is a biggie. When we talk on Thursday, we will talk about you know what, what you learned about yourself. And you guys, choking is one of the biggest things I think that has such a long-term consequence of somebody who doesn't deal with the tongue tie now. Um, I have a large population of people that are 50 to 80, and let me tell you, to teach an 80-year-old how to swallow correctly is so hard because she's choking. What happens is these people, you've obviously had this tongue tie forever, your body compensates and it helps you out, but eventually it gets tired of compensating. And so while nothing has changed and people are running to the doctor saying, I don't understand, 
why I'm all of a sudden choking. I know why they're all of a sudden choking because their compensations have given way. And so now they're doing, you know, swallowing tests, they're doing x-rays, they're doing all of these things and the doctor is just scratching the head going, I don't understand it. So these are the people who really, they're, they're really in two schools. They're either really mad or they're really mad. The, the reason they're really mad is some of them knew that they had a tongue tie and they didn't do anything about it. The other people are really mad because they didn't know they had a tongue tie and they're really mad that people, that somebody wasn't trained to, to help them out. I hope that makes sense. Okay, next. Do you chew your food and have to wash it down with liquid? That's a real common one. And that's just showing that you have an inefficient swallow. You don't have the right swallow. Which leads me to, and I don't have it on this slide here, um, but on the discovery checklist, it talks about the tongue thrusting forward, the back of the tongue doesn't lift during swallowing. So when you're doing your breathing tests, also you can do some chewing swallowing tests. If you already know that you have problems here, then that's easy. Uh, when I do an exam with people, they send me a video, so I get to watch them when I'm not staring at them, and I, I watch how they chew and swallow. If you don't feel your tongue move in this nice wave, then we have a problem, okay? So many people with a tongue tie, they're okay here, but you guys, I don't care about that as much as I care about this. So that's really important. The other thing, so, so many people come to me for a tongue thrust, and perhaps that, that is you saying, I know I have a tongue thrust. A tongue thrust is just a fancy way of saying you don't swallow right, okay? Some people, the tongue goes down, some pushes forward, some push out. You're supposed to have an adult swallow by age three. So, you know, children, they have an immature swallow, it's different, but by age three, it's supposed to be an adult swallow. This was me, I didn't swallow right. My tongue pushed forward on everything, which is not as detrimental as the resting tongue posture, but it still can be bad. Um, when it comes to a swallow, the most important part, the first step of a swallow is an intraoral suction. So if you have a tongue tie and you can't get your tongue suctioned to the roof of the mouth like that, you 100% don't swallow right. People all the time will say, well, I think I swallow okay, and that's just because you're doing okay right now, but I, can get, I, I will bet the farm you can't because you have that tongue tie and you learned how to swallow with, with a tongue thrust because you couldn't get this nice move. The same thing with like a, sucking a thumb, a bottle. Anybody who was bottle fed, we know that they have a tongue thrust or had because the bottle goes in on top of the tongue. The tongue can't go up and create a seal and have this movement. Uh, let me see what else here. So that's another thing to pay attention to. What does your tongue do? Obviously, when I help somebody correct their tongue thrust, we change that so that the tongue is not pushing out. What happens is if it's in the wrong place or you're swallowing, you can create an open bite. So it just pushes the teeth out so maybe the teeth won't come together. Um, if you're swallowing, so if you're swallowing with liquids, if you're choosing foods that are easy to chew, there's a reason. If you're picky about textures and gagging, there's a reason. So a, a lot of people will be picky about something and it's not necessarily about taste. So as you're filling this out for yourself, I want you to think about this. I'm not saying, would you eat liver and onions? I'm saying, were there textures that you wouldn't eat? Pork chops, um, steak, you know, think of those things that are hard to chew. Uh, I went through this, many of you guys already know this with my own granddaughter, that she used to be trying to chew something. And remember, if you have a tongue tie, it's hard to manipulate the tongue. So she would be trying to chew something, food would get down alongside her tongue, and it would gag her, and then she would vomit. So she thought that she had an allergy to pork chops. She thought everything that made her sick that she was allergic to, but it was more the, the, the textures and the work of having to chew that. Um, the gagging, 
that's the tongue tie, that's the weakness. So many people would come into my office when I was still in dental hygiene, you know, and they have to do x-rays and they say, oh, I don't want to do this. I have such a bad gag reflex. And I would look and I would do screen under their tongue and I would identify that they had a tongue tie. Some knew, some didn't, you know. So that's why these questions are all on there. Swallowing pills, I mean, anything that has to do with swallowing, that's why it's connected. Um, and, and then really another thing, and I always have to be real delicate about this because I, I work with more women than men, but I think that we all really do care how we look. But if you don't have the correct swallow, so if you don't have that nice intraoral suction and this nice wave, then you change the pressure in your mouth some other way because when you create that suction, that suction helps change the pressure which helps pull the food towards the throat, okay? If you can't do that, you do it other, way, other ways. Oftentimes that's using your cheeks. So I have lots of clients who have what's called a pursed lip swallow. So they use all of these muscles to swallow. Some of those are very obvious. If you start having really deep wrinkles around the mouth, if you start having really um, a lot of fine lines around the lips. I've had some clients that look like they're pack-a-day smokers for years and years, and they never have, and that's just from that dysfunctional swallow. So when you swallow, you shouldn't have anything moving except right here. You shouldn't have any pursing of these muscles here in the face. You certainly shouldn't be chicken necking, anything like that. So if you struggle, then you know that, that you have swallowing concerns. Let me see if there's anything else on here before we wrap up. I do want to touch on choosing easy to chew foods. As an adult, this may or may not be something that you realize that you do. I have had 40 year old women say, I make every food choice based on how hard it is to chew. I have some ladies who won't eat salad because it's really hard to manipulate. So these are things that you can be taking notes on because when you do something about your tongue tie, it's always fun to go back and revisit the different things that you didn't like because of textures or because of effort. Um, okay, I think that that sums that up. Let's see what I have here. Okay, so biggest takeaways from tonight, going through half of this discovery assessment. So why I go back to infancy. The biggest thing, you guys, is that your eyes don't see what your mind doesn't understand. So what might seem normal to you when you go through this process, when you see any of my um, videos, when you read any of my blogs, I mean, when you start to go, oh, this really, I had no idea. And, and I think that's what happens for a lot of people who have tongue ties. They take their children to the doctor, they some t somehow find out that maybe they have a concern, and then they start to dig and learn about this. But some people just, they're just oblivious. They say, nope, I don't have any digestive issues. And the more that we dig in, then they realize, oh, I just thought that my normal was normal. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it is. Uh, another takeaway that I want you to, to get out of this is that there, there might be other puzzle pieces. So I call it a comprehensive healthcare team. Um, if after what I've talked about, if you're thinking, oh, I do need to make that appointment with the ENT, my tonsils need to come out. I know that nobody's excited about that ever, let alone if we're older. You can't ignore it. And if you don't know if your tonsils are a concern, look in the back of your throat, okay? Uh, because that's, if you're snoring, that's probably a big culprit. I do have a lot of adults that do an exam with me and I'm just dumbfounded at the size of their tonsils and nobody has ever told them that they're a concern, but yet they're snoring like a freight train, okay? So other pieces of the puzzle. You will learn this as we continue on, but if you already know that you have a deviated septum and you can't breathe through both of your nostrils, you need to get that appointment made because I don't want you 
to have a phrenectomy. I don't want you to continue on with the 10 lessons because you're not ready. Okay, so think about that. Um, allergists, do you need to go to the allergist? Do you need meds? Do you need to make diet changes? I always want my clients to get off meds. And I always have gotten them off meds, but sometimes we have to get on the meds to, to get the congestion under control. So when, when we're talking about like allergies and medications, I have a lot of people who have to start with a med so that they can start to learn how to nasal breathe or else we're just wasting our time. So uh, eventually I do want you to get off of meds because I don't want to put band-aids on bullet wounds. Um, diet changes, again, if dairy bothers you, it's got to go. If, if you get congested by sugar, alcohol, gluten, you have to decide that it's going to be worth it in the long run to make those changes. And then the digestive breathing connection, that sympathetic, parasympathetic, re those responses, and, and belly breathing. That is huge, and so many people, um, they call me crazy. They call me crazy all the time when they say, there is no way that how I chew my food can be connected to this, or breathing can be connected to this. You guys, this stuff, by the time I'm done teaching you guys after four days, uh, or definitely three days, you're going to be saying, oh, I can't believe how all of this is tied together, literally.